if I asked you to define success for elementary, middle, high school, and even college students, it's likely that you would identify grades, particularly those of A's and B's, as the best measures of academic success. As a higher education professional that works with engineering students teaching them how to learn, I recognize that grades are an important measure, but they don't tell the whole story. And I'm not alone in this. There are entire academic institutions that have moved away from traditional grading scales. Take Brown University, for example. In the 1969-1970 school year, Brown decided to restructure their curriculum. And as part of that restructure, they gave their students a choice between an A, B, C grade, non-credit grading scale and a satisfactory no-credit grading scale. They also decided to stop tracking cumulative GPA and class rankings. They even moved away from publishing a dean's list. And they did all of this curriculum restructuring to place their students at the center of their education and to also move away from simply teaching students facts to teaching them how to think. You see, our students are socialized from their, uh, by their education experience from a very early age. They come to understand that getting high grades is a way to demonstrate their academic aptitude. They notice this by watching. They watch the parents, their parents and their teachers and the positive responses that they receive from consistently being able to get high grades and to produce right answers. They also notice the negative responses that they get for their grades leaving a bit to be desired and for producing wrong answers. We actually have a story in the black oral tradition about our discomfort with wrong answers. As the story goes, a parent is helping their child with some math homework, and they're doing word problems, so the parent reads the problem to the child, saying something like, if Johnny had five apples, and he gives two apples to his friends, how many apples does Johnny have left? The child in the story responds enthusiastically and incorrectly, something like, five. The parent, frustrated and borderline angrily, repeats the question. If Johnny had five apples and he gives two apples to his friends, how many apples does Johnny have left? We laugh at this story because we identify with the situation and the characters in it. If you've ever helped your child or a student with a homework problem that you believe they should know, you can identify with the frustration and impatience that comes with believing they should be able to focus a little better. But for the child in this situation, there's real pressure to provide a right answer because their wrong answer has been met with judgment and frustration. And it's not hard to see how the child could walk away from this interaction believing that there's something wrong with being wrong. If you can identify with the child in the story, it's likely that you came to understand that wrong answers were not only undesirable, but perhaps even shameful. If you were a high-performing student in grade school, you probably internalized the idea that getting high grades meant that you were proving your worth and value because of all of the positive responses that you got for those grades. This could produce an ego response, making you believe that the thing that was special about you is that you're smart. And by extension, Getting wrong answers and getting low grades were threats to your status as a smart kid. I try to tell my students that they're learning even when they don't realize it. And this subconscious learning takes place all the time and throughout their education. They come to learn that they can put in a certain amount of effort to get good responses and good outcomes with their grades. They also know how much they need to do to get by and not get negative outcomes and negative interactions. I understand this because I was a high-performing student. In high school, I got straight A's, and so I try to use my experiences to help my students understand how to navigate the learning process. Now, I got these straight A's in ways that you might not define as the best academic habits. You see, the night before a big exam, you could find me with a stack of flashcards memorizing and cramming the information in. And if there was a big project or paper due the next day, you could find me in the wee hours of the morning typing away at the computer or gluing construction paper to a trifold, many times with my mother in tow. Sorry, Mom. You see, for me, no matter how late I waited to start an assignment or how inconsistent I was in terms of keeping up and managing my time well, 
I was always able to flip a switch and to turn on the effort to secure a high grade. And in my mind, that was enough. The ends justified the means. The subconscious learning that I engaged in made me believe that there was something special about my level of smart. I could just attend class and pay attention and absorb the information and take good notes, go home and do my homework and study when I needed to, and that was enough. This was an ego boost for me because in my mind, my level of work was enough and I was supposed to get these high grades. Now my students can identify with this experience. And for all of us, there comes a time when simply relying on your academic aptitude isn't enough. I remember vividly when this moment happened for me. I was taking a physics class at my undergraduate institution and our professor was handing back our first exam. As mine was handed to me, I noticed a bright red 29 in the top right corner. And I quickly folded it in half and tucked it into my bag because I was embarrassed and ashamed. And it was a huge shot to my ego. In that moment, I began to question whether I was smart enough to do this level of work. And it was the first time I'd had this kind of experience. Luckily, I was able to ask for help. And I had good mentorship at my undergraduate uh, institution. And those higher education professionals helped me to really face my failure and not just stop at the fact that I'd gotten a 29, but to ask myself why. What was wrong with my preparation? What had I missed in my study? What could I have done better? Through intense work with them that semester, I was able to salvage a C in that physics class. And I will tell you, Every high grade I secured thereafter, I owe to the work I did in earning that C, which suggests that not all Cs are created equal and not all grades are either. You see, I want students to understand that missing the mark, getting questions wrong, and even failing, they're all part of the learning process. If we can acknowledge that we don't know a thing, then we can give ourselves space to make mistakes along the way of learning it. We literally cannot learn things that we already know. And so we can give ourselves permission to deal with our failure moments by learning from them. If we can accept that being wrong is a part of the learning process, then we gain opportunities to evaluate our problem solving, our mindset, and our processing, to identify the weaknesses in our study strategies and to identify things that we misunderstand, and to develop understanding. This is a powerful and liberating mindset. We can release the need to be perfect and gain access to learning opportunities. For the students I work with, this can be used in myriad ways. There are situations where they go to a lecture and their professor is explaining a really con complex concept, and the professor pauses the lecture to ask the entire class, are there any questions? And so many times in this situation, the whole class remains silent. And it's not because there aren't questions, it's because so the students are afraid to identify themselves as the one, in their mind, the only one in the room who doesn't know what's going on or who needs clarification or another example. But on the other side of our ego and our fear are literal opportunities to have our questions answered if we're willing to release the need to always appear that we have it together. We can allow ourselves to be wrong, and that being wrong can create opportunities for us. So when my students experience situations like I did with receiving that 29 on the exam, instead of feeling that that means that they are failures, they can understand that failing doesn't make us a failure. It gives us an opportunity to make changes. They can ask why they failed the exam. They can evaluate their study habits and realize they didn't do enough to really get a good grade in the first place. And they can adjust and give themselves an opportunity to learn. So what if we didn't see failure and academic failure specifically as an end, but as more of a stepping off point? We could give ourselves a chance to, be, to see wrong answers and being wrong as part of the process. In the story I told about the parent, instead of being frustrated with the child, maybe you could ask a clarifying question 
or provide a visual aid to help the child understand that there are three apples left. See, if, we're, if we release the need to be impatient or frustrated with wrong answers, we can create learning opportunities. And we can stop feeling as though these moments where we get it wrong or fall short of the mark or fail mean that we're disqualified from being intelligent or being that smart kid. So the next time that you experience a situation when you're wrong, what if you rejected the ego response of being embarrassed or frustrated and instead embraced a very human experience of just having it wrong and needing to adjust? If we can give ourselves the grace to be able to learn from our failure moments, then we can create opportunities for ourselves and others to get it right. Thank you.